Welcome to How to Use Zoom for Business and Look Like an Expert. This is presentation skills expert, Patricia Fripp. There are two types of content. Time less. Content that I present in my Fripp virtual training and all my coaching and seminars. Then there is time Lee content, which is needed in the moment. We are living in a time where, until recently, tens of millions of people were on Zoom. Now, with everybody working at home, hundreds of millions of people are using Zoom. Rather than spend another three weeks helping our clients and colleagues get up to speed, this is a public service announcement on how to use this valuable tool to your advantage. For the last four years, we have successfully used Zoom for our client and prospect meetings, for coaching, for Zooming into meetings and conferences and sales meetings to present, and to demo our online learning system, FripBT. It's very important that you know, Paul, who is the director of client experience who will be leading most of this presentation. We do not work for Zoom. We have no affiliate program with Zoom. We are just enthusiastic customers who have enjoyed using it to our advantage in business. So very simply, if you are not used to working at home, you still need to dress up and go to work even if it's to a different room or part of your house. Make sure that your background is tidy. Now, Paul will show you many options of what you can do. This is my real office, and I have an image of the Golden Gate Bridge. I live in San Francisco. Many of my clients say, Patricia, is that your view? To which I answer, if it were, my house would be worth $2 million more than it is. However, it is a nice backdrop that also brands the city I'm in. Because I am online in Zoom as much as eight hours a day, I have good lighting as well, which you might want to consider, and a professional microphone. You can't see it, but it will improve the quality of sounds, especially when I'm delivering web presentations to hundreds of people. Now, some practical advice. You, spending all day in Zoom, will need to drink. And I recommend that you use a straw so that you can still make eye contact and not be seen picking up a bottle or a glass. Now, I, of course, being the fashion plate that I am, make sure my straw matches what I am wearing or my glasses. That's up to you. So now, for a more detailed way of how to use Zoom and look like professional, here is Paul Griffin, the Director of Client Experience for Fripp VT, who is the more technical part of our business. Take it away, Paul. Thank you very much. So we are going to first go through the basics of Zoom. This is from a largely technological standpoint so bear with us. So you have the free versus the paid options. This is truly a you get what you pay for type of situation. With the free version, you don't necessarily have a guarantee of receiving HD or high definition quality video, especially now that our servers are used a lot more with everything that's going on right now. They're actually cutting HD streams from the free options. The paid accounts will still continue to have an HD stream as long as you have enough bandwidth to do so. For the storage, with the free version, you don't get any cloud storage. You have to store recordings on your local computer. In the paid version, the $14.99 a month, you get one gigabyte of cloud storage. However, that's only about enough for one hour's worth of HD video. So you might want to have to upgrade as you go along through there. The, with the length of the meeting in the free version, you have an unlimited amount of time for one-on-one -on -one meetings. 
in certain circumstances right now with, with the pandemic that's happening, they are offering K through 12 teachers a longer amount of time with the free account. But for the most part, you're gonna have unlimited one-on-one -on -one and a limit of 40 minutes to a group meeting of two or more people, including yourself. So with the paid version, you have an unlimited amount of time with those group meetings up to 100 participants. So the paid version is really going to be beneficial, especially right now. With the free version, you could possibly have the connection throttled, which means that if they have a high server load or there's a lot of people online at one time, then they may reduce the amount of bandwidth they assign you because you are in a free account and that's not going to do anything to help with your connection. For the personal room ID, that is also with the paid account. This is one that you can pick out your own room ID so it's not automatically assigned by the computer. So it's a little more secure and of course it's a personal, a personalized number. With computer memory using Zoom, you have to make sure, especially if you have an older computer, that you're closing anything that takes up a lot of memory. These are applications like Chrome, Microsoft Office, any of them, or any of the Adobe suite of products, because these take a tremendous amount of system resources, and this could potentially slow down your Zoom meeting. You also have the option of a webinar. So with Zoom, you can add the webinar feature onto your account and have up to 100 participants in a webinar environment, which goes into some different interactive uh, options with the attendees. The biggest difference is when someone comes into the call, unless they've been invited by the host as a panelist, they will automatically be in an attendee status, which means they will not be able to show their video or audio unless you invite them to the meeting to share that. With your equipment, as Patricia said, having more professional equipment is going to greatly improve your image quality, your sound quality, and just the quality of the recording. So we have a Blue Yeti microphone, a Logitech HD webcam, and I have a green screen here in my office so I can change my background, which I'll show you in just a few moments. Anytime you're going to be giving a presentation, practice a lot beforehand until you're completely comfortable or whoever is helping you with it, you're completely comfortable with them because you want to make sure you're comfortable with the interface before you go live. This is going to help a lot with how you feel going through. Also have a test call, have a friend, family member, colleague, dial in from their computer or iPad or mobile device and just go through the motions with you with the different interactions, with the different ways of talking with the audience, sharing your video, sharing your screen. Test everything before you go live, even if you've done it a hundred times before. And Paul, so if I may interject here, many people are very uncomfortable having their webcam on. It is much more difficult to build rapport if you can't see people or have the confidence that all your team members are paying attention to the meeting and not on another computer doing their email. So we're going to re certainly recommend that you do that. We deliver webinars on a regular basis and we always rehearse and we encourage our co-presenters to rehearse from the room or the office that they will be coming in to present for us. When we deliver for client meetings, we always do the same thing well in advance. Certainly go in early the next morning, 30 minutes before you're going live, but always do it before. It doesn't matter how seasoned you are with technology, you never quite know what's going to happen and you want to feel comfortable. In the Zoom training that Paul will talk about later, they recommend always rehearse and test. All right, so going forward, we have, um, I was on moderator. So if you can, if you have the option, have someone that is going to join you, like I joined Patricia on these calls, 
as a co-host or replacement host so they could interact with other attendees in the room, take care of any technical issues or questions that might come up that you don't want to have to deal with when you're presenting something. Because as a presenter, you need to pay attention to delivering content for the audience. If you have a large meeting where you might have dozens of notes in the chat, you as the presenter or leader of the meeting really does not have the time to look through. If anyone is having technical problems, you can't solve them. Your moderator can do that. If you're answering questions, it's much better for a moderator to say, Patricia, there are three people who want to know. Back to you, Paul. And then we have, if you are a member of a professional organization, a university, college, a school system, check with anyone that's in charge of that organization to see if they either have a paid version of Zoom already available for their students and members and faculty, or if there's a discount. Like for the National Speakers Association, they have an amazing deal for Zoom with Zoom webinar. So that is definitely something you want to look into to save yourself some time and money. We're gonna take a brief look at security with Zoom. Due to its increased popularity in general, not to mention how much they've exploded recently, there's been a little bit more attention to security issues. So these are just a few options to help better secure your meeting to prevent any outside influence. The first item we have are Zoom bombers. It's not quite as bad as it sounds. It's someone that comes in, freezes the meeting, and then writes graffiti, shares inappropriate content, and there's really nothing you can do about it for a few moments, and your meeting is derailed, and that is not helpful. There have been some security hacks where people have physically installed an application alongside Zoom that affects the way Zoom connects. But if you protect yourself and only download from the Zoom servers and only let people that you trust into the room, you're mitigating your risk right there. The personal room ID is one of the biggest security options that you can do in my opinion, because it's not a randomly generated number. So there's less of a chance of someone choosing that or generating it because we have people that would just type in random numbers and hope it's a room that they can wreak some havoc in. When you if you're having a small meeting or even a large meeting and you know that everyone is in the meeting that is supposed to, you can lock the room to where no one else can join. This way you prevent any anyone coming into the room that you don't want there. Don't publicize the room meeting ID on social media, email, or any public forum if you can help it. If you're giving a public webinar, obviously you're going to have to share the registration link, but you can also require registration to where people have to give their email address and name. It's not an absolute, but it at least helps along. So if you have someone monitoring the people coming in, then they'll be able to watch out for anything suspicious. When someone joins your meeting room, you can have the option in the settings on the Zoom website to put them in a waiting room. So this is just gonna put them in a holding area until you admit them into the main meeting. So this way, if you have back-to-back -back meetings and someone's waiting and they sign in early, they don't interrupt what you're already doing. You can also remove a user from a meeting and you have the option in the settings to either allow them to rejoin if it was just if you, for instance, had to remove someone because their sound was temporarily too loud and they weren't muted, or if you want to remove them permanently, that's also an option. Practice the administrative controls as uh, again before you have a meeting. So you want to practice removing someone, restricting the chat. I had a, a client that was a teacher and she was dealing with multiple students at a time. And some of the older students, she relied on them being able to use the chat but at the same time, they would type extraneous comments to one another that had nothing to do with what was going on. So you can actually turn the chat on and off throughout the call. So that helped her a lot with that. And then we, uh, your video and audio settings are very important because you don't want to accidentally go live on video when you're not ready. The same thing for audio. It can be very embarrassing. So keep an eye, a close eye on that. 
Now, just touching on the connection and having a live call and the controls that you have. Always, always, always restart your computer. I don't care if you have the most powerful computer in the world, restart it before every meeting. Close any unnecessary applications. I have a fairly decent setup and I would still every once in a while, if the bandwidth was taxed a good bit, I would still get a jumpy video if Outlook fetched, video, uh, fetched emails. So always close anything, especially the applications that require an internet connection. If you're living in a home, working from home, obviously, if you're at home with children or family, what have you, if at all possible, make sure they're not using the bandwidth that you're using. So if you are using uh, the Wi-Fi or hopefully a hardwired connection via ethernet cable, make sure that they're not using Wi-Fi as much as possible for Netflix, video games, streaming music, what have you. They can use preferably cellular audio temporarily while you're presenting that way you have as much connection strength as possible. Speaking of connection strength, as I mentioned, if you can get hardwired to the modem, please do. That is the strongest and most consistent connection. And I, this is just my opinion. I suggest at least 150 megabytes per second on your internet speed. If you have less than that, you'll run into issues sometimes with the video lagging or the audio and video not being synchronized together. This is especially important now because as Patricia mentioned, Zoom went from a tens of millions of people at one instance on their servers to hundreds of millions. So there's a lot of bandwidth being taken up and anything you can do to help that along is helpful. Don't forget to record if you want to record. We've had several meetings, well, I've had several meetings that occasionally I'll forget to hit the record button and then you have to go back and redo part of the meeting and it's not ideal. So just remember, if you're going to record, do so and remind the audience that you're going to record. They'll be able to see an icon that says you're recording, but it's always polite just to make sure that they understand that this is a recorded call and anything that they may do or say will appear on the recording. Now, Paul is, is not throwing me under the bus because we recently had a public for our community webinar. And because I have a very good setup, the recording is better when I do the recording on my end and I forgot. And he, as a co-presenter, as a co-host, which is important, he noticed and turned it off. So what we did, because we realized at the end of the meeting, I just went back and re-recorded the front and had it spliced in for before we sent it out as the recording. So that was my fault. But now we are consciously aware to remind each other, to hit the record button. Absolutely. So we're gonna go into the actual meeting controls for just a moment. So when you have the video open, this is an example with two attendees in the meeting room, there's an icon in the upper right hand corner. Now this can sometimes be confusing because what that icon says is not the view that you're currently in, it's and you click it to get to that view. So what you see right now with the video side by side is the gallery view. This puts all of the meeting attendees that can fit onto however large you have the screen size side by side, whether it's 2, 10, or 20. Then you have the speaker view, which shows a line at the top for the first five or six videos, and then you can have a button you can click to see more. And then the active speaker is in the forefront of the video window. So that way, anyone who is currently speaking will be the one that you see on that screen. Now, the exception to this is if you hover over their video, you will see three small dots at the top. If you click those three small dots, you can pin their video to the main screen. So you will only see that person for the duration of the call or for the duration of however long you want to see them on, that, on the big part of the screen. This will only affect your view. If you're a host, 
this will affect the way you see it, not your attendees, with the exception of the recording. So you have different recording features. I encourage you to go to the settings section on the Zoom website under your account and familiarize yourself with all of the feature options there. Now, for example, I belong to the Golden Gate Breakfast Club and we have the most wonderful, exciting early morning Wednesday meetings, which are now virtual. So whenever they introduce the speaker after the socializing and our normal roll call, as if we were in person, we introduce the speaker and I always pin them so I can sit back and really enjoy them almost as if they were right in front of me. So that's very valuable. Now, although I certainly am keeping my webcam on all the time, what you might have noticed, or perhaps didn't notice, I coughed. So I went over and turned off my microphone when I did that. So it's just a matter of being aware of where these, these symbols are so that you can do it. And again, look as professional and not distract from what's going on. You're doing a great job, Paul, keep going. Thank you. So we have the main control bar for the live video call. So as you can see, there are two icons on the left for audio with the microphone and video with the camera. Clicking those will either start or stop your audio depending on what the current status is. Then you have the other options to the right of that, which will go over now. So with the audio options, if you click the arrow next to the button, you'll be able to choose a microphone that's attached to your computer if you need to change it, an audio outsource, which would be speakers internal or external, and then you have the options to test your speaker microphone, switch to the telephone audio, or delete the audio altogether. Then there are further audio settings, which you're welcome to go in and review in detail. For the video controls, you have the options of whatever cameras or virtual camera setups you have attached to your computer. So for me, I have the HD webcam with an application that it changes the view so I can zoom in on my video and it's not quite as large in the background. You can also choose a virtual background, which I'll go over in a few slides as well. And then there are also more advanced video settings such as changing the HD quality of the video and changing the orientation of the way that you see the video, whether it's mirrored or flipped around to the other way. The invite option, this allows you to invite people to the meeting. If you are using Gmail or Yahoo, click on one of those. It will automatically open your email into a, to compose an email to send to whoever you want to invite. If you have a different default email client like Outlook or Airmail or the Mac Mail app, click on the default email and it will bring up uh, an email to compose to anyone that you would like to invite that way. And that will automatically pre-fill all of the details to log into the meeting through the URL and also give options on dialing in via audio. If you want to send your own invitation in your email client, click on copy invitation, it'll save that to the clipboard and you can paste into an email to send out. Or if you just want to send someone the URL, click copy URL and that will also save it to the clipboard and you can paste it into an email. So next up we have the controls for the participants. So when you click on manage participants, you'll see something similar to what we have on the left. It has Patricia and I both listed as being in the room. And one of the most important parts of understanding if someone's connected, you see the microphone and camera. The camera will always be there. It'll either be, it'll either look how it looks right now or have a slash through it, meaning that the camera is not active. If the microphone is present, then the uh, person at the other end is connected to audio. If the microphone is not present, they cannot hear you and you cannot hear them. So if someone connects and says they can't hear you, the first thing you check is the microphone. If it has a slash through it, then their microphone is muted. If it does not, then their audio should be fine. So they might need to unplug earpods, earpods from their computer or turn up the volume. 
So in the participant controls, you have options to mute participants on entry, which mutes their microphone by default. You, have, you can either allow them to unmute themselves or you can do it manually for them. The enter and exit chime just plays a doorbell sound when, any, when anyone comes in and then a different audio sound when someone exits. Allow participants to rename themselves. You'll notice that a lot of, a lot of the times someone won't have their full name or they'll have a weird name as their name in Zoom. You can change that if you wish because the name is recorded in the meeting recording. Lock the meeting, we, we spoke of it before. Clear all feedback would clear any of the feedback controls you see above where it says yes, no, go slower, et cetera. And finally, put participants in waiting room on entry. If you don't have this enabled by default, you can select this and it will put them in that meeting room before it allows them into the main room with you. Next, we have polling questions. If you have the paid account, you have the option of polling your audience. If you have not set up your polling questions prior to the meeting, you can click here, click add a question. It will open in a web browser. You can add your question on the fly and then it will give you an option to present it to your attendees. Once you click launch poll, they will have the option to vote on, an op uh, vote on one of the answers and then it will also have a timer so you'll know whether you can say, oh, we're going to set this timer for 30 seconds, answer your question, etc. Now, if you want to share your screen, you have different options. I always suggest if you're sharing your screen, share a window. Don't share the whole desktop unless you need to for the purposes of the call, because you might have something open in the background that you're not thinking of that could lead to distraction on the call as well. So the options are you have your desktops. If you have a second monitor, it will ask you if you want to share that. A whiteboard, which allows you to draw on the screen. You can actually share your iPad screen or iPhone. So you can, if you're demonstrating an app or how something looks on mobile, you have that option. And then finally, the Zoom account. The biggest benefit to Zoom's application with sharing your screen is right down here in the bottom left where it says share computer sound. Normally, when you hear sound in a webinar, you're hearing it from the host speaker coming through the microphone. When you click share computer sound, you're actually going to hear the host's audio as if you are viewing that video through your own computer. So it's gonna be a lot clearer and a lot more crisp. With the chat box, you have exactly what it sounds like. You can chat with your attendees, your attendees can chat with you, and they have the option to send it, the attendee has the option to send it to everyone or the host privately or each other privately. The host has controls where the, you can, this is where you toggle the chat, where the participants can chat with no one, the host, everyone publicly and everyone publicly and privately. A note on private conversations, if you are having a private conversation to a host or vice versa, that will get recorded in the transcript with the host's account. If you are an attendee sending a private message to an attendee, that will not be recorded in the host chat log. Now for the recording, what we discussed earlier, if you have a free account, you will only be able to record on the computer. If you have a cloud account, you can record to the cloud or the local computer. And while the call is being recorded, so where, where you see the record button here will actually say pause or stop. Pause recording, means that you're going to pause it and it's going to create different videos of wherever you pause. I'm sorry, it's gonna create the same video of where you pause, but if you stop and start, it will create separate video clips. So that way you can have separate clips to edit later, or you can just pause within the same video clip. So for example, when I am using this for coaching clients, we might pause the recording while they are taking notes or if someone wants to go take a break and then we come back when we're picking up the coaching then the first part might be going through scripting 
all the goals of the presentation. Then we will close it and begin again when my coach E goes through the presentation that we've been working on. Very often, my clients will deliver their version of the presentation. Then we'll stop, turn off the recording, do some work together, do some re-scripting, and then I'll bring up the recording again where they can hear their perfected version. I record everything because it's better in case when you're brainstorming and a brilliant idea comes out, you say, oh, that was good. What did you just say? Well, in the moment, you can't remember. So I work on the principle, it's better to record it and not listen to it than have something brilliant happen and not have it recorded. But if you're working on a project as speech coaching, it works very well if you have a before, off, after. Back to you, Paul. All right, now, so we're gonna move on br very briefly to support. When you have someone that's sharing their screen, you can click on the support option and request to remote control their computer. This is immeasurably helpful when you're offering support to someone or if you're showing them how to use something on the computer or in, within the system. Now we'll get into the background that you have options for in the Zoom meeting. So they have it they, within the past year, they've come up with a virtual background option. It is best to be used with a green screen, but you don't have to. It's just cleaner and it, it, it makes the lines that go around you with the image in the background a lot tighter. You have the option of an image or a video you're really gonna to wanna to balance what's going to be more professional and what's personal for professional, something clean that doesn't distract. For a personal call, sure, have the, have the waves crashing behind you because you're just having fun and you don't have to worry about focus quite as much. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you can see the green screen that I, or the background that I have. And I'll give you a few examples. So this is a standard background that I use. It's just an image from our Fret virtual training platform. When you're giving a presentation to a specific client, it's nice to have their logo. It makes them feel special and paid attention to, and it shows that you're going the extra mile. So we have different options of just taking a plain white background and copying and pasting their logo into it. Just make sure that you don't resize the logo other than how they have it in the marketing materials. And you might wanna ask them if they have a marketing guide because many companies have very specific guidelines with how the logo needs to appear, color, even size is very specific. So it never hurts to ask. If you're giving a presentation that is in conjunction with a partnership, you can double up the logos. So this is an example when we had a partnership with a company in our Frit VT, we use that logo. Or if it's partners under one company's name or the companies that partner together, you can put a cluster of logos together. It's really, you can do whatever you want to with it as long as you're fitting the guidelines of that company. And it makes them, like I said, feel good. And, and, and this is really good if you are delivering a sales presentation or a conversation to say, that your company and our company is an unbeatable combination. And if you are promoting an event, for example, uh, Zebra and their channel partner summit, show some of their logos. Now this, what you are seeing is from a live convention of the American Payroll Association. They always have wonderful backdrops and and energy and color. Now with more and more companies having their virtual conference, what you can still do is have a backdrop as if you were together in person. And if you're making your 
what would be your get together conference different than your all hands meeting. This is a great way to give a whole different energy. I was just suggesting to a client this morning that when people come in, you can have music in the background as if you were walking into a convention hall. So this is a great way to make virtual meetings sound and feel more like you were really at the convention together. For the fun ones, we have the beach where we all wish we were and hopefully are not. Hopefully we're staying home, staying healthy. But you know, if you're having a fun call, there's a beach background, Aurora Borealis, floating in the air next to Big Ben. <laughs> And then so some more professional uh, backgrounds. And you can find these by simply Googling free Zoom virtual backgrounds. That's how I found nearly every single one of these. And they're high definition and they're free. So we have just a very serene background. This would be a little more professional, so it's not quite as busy. This one is just some out of focus color. So there's nothing distracting from you who are, you know, bring the content to the table. And then you have, trying to see, and then, you know, if you want to pretend you're in Patricia's office in San Francisco, you have <laughs> this one. So there's, there, it's, the, the only limit is your imagination when it comes to what backgrounds you can use. And it's really, it really lends a lot of professionalism to the meeting and it just makes you look better. Yeah. And, so and the, if you are working at home, it, it's for business meetings these are ways that you can look professional. If you are delivering content and you're not used to it at the very beginning, invite a friend or a family member in so that you have somebody to talk to if you're not comfortable talking to what you feel is nobody. So Paul, that was a wonderful demonstration. Thank you for your preparation. I could not be in business using Zoom as much as I do without your help and support in the background. So if you can bring up the content slide one more time, uh, uh, as we say, Paul and I are very happy to provide this information for our friends and clients. However, we are not in the business of supporting Zoom. We are a small boutique firm that helps our clients improve their conversations and presentations that drive sales. So thank you for your interest. We hope this is valuable. And in the new world of communicating through Zoom, it can make a major difference because remember, your success depends a lot on the quality and quantity of your relationships. And you can solidify relationships virtually through Zoom and other platforms. Thank you. <laughs>